Natural Law and the Theory of Property, Grotius to Hume, by Stephen Buckle. Chapter 5, David Hume. Number 1, The Problem of Reconciliation. The preceding chapter provides a sketch of how the concern for a, psycholog um, a psychology of action adequate to the requirements of natural law, that is, a theory of action which is both firmly founded in human nature and which shows sociability as an essential expression of that nature, leads to the reje rejection of the selfish aspect of Locke's psychology of action, while retaining its hedonism. By broadening the sources of pleasure to include the perception of beauty, and by providing an account of virtue in terms of the beauty of actions or characters, the theory of the moral sense attempts to provide a foundation for human sociability, as an adequate natural law theory must. But sociability is more than the mere desire for or enjoyment of human society. It also requires a social order which reflects the measure of human intelligence and of the elements of this order. It is justice, which most essentially means the rules of property, that is of most importance. But justice requires the following of a rule, regardless of its consequences in particular cases. In Hutchinson's language, it requires the recognition of external rights. And where these consequences are contrary to benevolence, the Hutchinsonian moral sense theory cannot account for our obligation to be just. It cannot explain our sense of justice, of duty. The burden of this chapter is that one central aim of Hume's moral and political theory is to solve this internal problem of natural jurisprudence, and that he can therefore be understood to be a contributor to natural law social theory. Before turning to, this, to the problems this view raises, it will be instructive to consider briefly the views of one of Hume's more sympathetic contemporary critics. In the second of his essays on the principles of morality and natural religion, in 1751, entitled Of the Foundation and Principles of the Law of Nature, Hume's friend and relative Henry Home, Lord Kames, argues, in typical natural law vein, that the law of nature is founded in human nature and concludes that, for a complete account of natural law, it will be necessary to trace out human nature with all the accuracy possible. This leads him to give an account of the principles of human action, and, in order to account for our recognition of the beauty of the actions and characters of free agents, a recognition which leads us to praise and, in appropriate circumstances, to emulate them, he defends the reality of the moral sense. However, he criticizes all previous accounts of this sense, including Hutchison's, for the reason already given. He then goes on to give an account of justice, and of our obligation to justice, which attempts to over overcome the shortcomings of the previous theories. One important insight of this account, the negativity of the virtue of justice, is later taken up in considerably more detail by Adam Smith. Hume's principal target in his essays is Hume's treatise, published just over ten years earlier. But he does not attack Hume for abandoning natural law, nor does he consider the treatise to be outside the context of the natural law debate. In fact, he sees the author of the treatise upon human nature as a contributor to the same debate. And in the light of Hume's constructive program in the second and third books of the treatise, it is easy to see why he should have thought so. For Hume's positive program, there is this there is, the same as Kames in the essays, to provide an account of the principles of action, as part of a more complete account of the constitution of the human passions, which are themselves the mainsprings of all human action, together with an account of the nature and origins of justice, with special attention to the nature of our obligation to obey its rules, the latter following a short section which both defends the moral sense and accepts that alone it cannot provide a complete account of our moral obligations. It is not surprising, then, that Kames should have considered Hume to be a contributor to the development of an adequate account of natural law. This chapter will argue that he was correct to think so. To claim Hume as a contributor to natural law, however, seems to fly in the face of some well-established conceptions of Hume the philosopher. 
Of these, the conceptions of Hume as the Newtonian philosopher who introduced experimental reasoning into moral subjects, or as the skeptical destroyer of all established philosophy, are here the most pertinent. So before, before defending the natural law interpretation of Hume, mainly by showing why he should have described his theory of justice as akin to that of Grotius, and by showing in what way justice is artificial rather than natural, it will first be necessary to show how, or to what extent, a natural law interpretation is compatible with these established conceptions. At this point, it is appropriate to acknowledge that, in defending a natural law interpretation of Hume, I am following a lead established by Duncan Forbes in Hume's Philosophical po Politics. Further, more specific debts will become clearer along the way. The task itself of reconciling as far as possible the various conceptions of Hume's philosophy can now be turned to. The picture of Hume as a Newtonian philosopher presents the, f the fewer problems, so it is best considered first. Section 2. The Newtonian Hume owes his reputation as the Newtonian philosopher to his intention, expressed on the title page of the treatise, to introduce the experimental method of reasoning into moral subjects. At a rather superficial level, this intention leads Hume to engage in the thought experiments of the treatise. More importantly, it is reflected in a self-conscious methodology, involving in particular um, commitments to the principle of parsimony and to grounding all conclusions firmly in experience. To illustrate the latter first, in the abstract of the treatise, he indirectly describes his overall aim in these terms. "'Tis at least worthwhile to try if the science of man will not admit of the same accuracy which several parts of natural philosophy are found susceptible of." To secure this end, the author of the treatise proposes to anatomize human nature in a regular manner, and promises to draw no conclusions but where he is authorized by experience. He talks with contempt of hypotheses. The final remark here echoes Newton's statements in the optics that hypotheses are not to be regarded in experimental philosophy. However, reconciling it with what Hume actually does say about hypotheses in the treatise, where, particularly in Book 2, he uses it in much the way we would use the term like theory, requires a good deal of constructive interpretation. His principal intention is, apparently, to reject a priori principles. An example can be found at the end of the inquiry, in, at the end of the inquiry concerning human understanding, where the ancient maxim, ex nihilo nihil fit, is dealt a summary execution. It ceases to be a maxim according to this philosophy. The same requirement that all knowledge be grounded firmly in experience is not to be restricted to natural inquiries, but must occur in morals as well. This is succinctly expressed in the inquiry concerning the principle of morals. Men are now cured of their passion for hypotheses and systems in natural philosophy, and will hearken to no arguments but those which are derived from experience. It is full time they should attempt a like re reformulation in all moral disquisitions, and reject every system of ethics, however subtle or ingenious, which is not founded on fact and observation. The method to be followed requires, according to the treaties, a cautious observation of human life in the common course of the world. The fruit of such labor will be a new science, where experiments of this kind are judiciously collected and compared. We may hope to establish on them a science, which will not be inferior in certainty, and will be much superior in utility to any other of the human comprehension. These statements can serve to indicate, in broad outline, the nature and aims of Hume's first Newtonian feature, his experimentalism. His second significantly Newtonian principle is parsimony, or as he usually describes it, simplicity. This is illustrated in the opening section of Book 2 of the treatise, where he observes that we must we find in the course of nature that though the effects be many, the principles from which they arise are commonly but few and simple, and that tis the sign of an unskillful naturalist to have recourse to a different quality, in order to explain every different operation. He adds that, because this principle is so rarely observed, moral philosophy is the same is in the same condition as natural, with regard to astronomy before the time of Copernicus. 
He also invokes this principle in Book 3 to defend the account given of the role of sympathy in moral judgments. <clears throat> In the abstract, the task of natural philosophy is described as finding those few simple principles on which all the rest depend. The abstract goes on to place the treatise's contribution to natural philosophy in its demonstration that all the operations of the mind must, in a great measure, depend on the three principles of the association of ideas. Adding that, tis the use he makes of the principle of the association of ideas, showing it to be one of those few simple principles that can entitle the author to so glorious a name as that of an inventor. Once again, however, the clearest statement is in the second inquiry, a work which, unlike the treatise, also attempts to display a simplicity of intellectual structure. The account of the role of utility in the social virtues is there is there justified on the ground that it is entirely agreeable to the rules of philosophy and even common reason where any principle has been found to have a great force and energy in one instance to ascribe it to a like energy in all similar instances. This indeed is Newton's chief rule of philosophizing. Despite these remarks, Hume's displays Hume displays a measure of agreement with critics of the Newtonian passion for simple principles. For example, Berkeley criticizes the tendency of Newtonian science to encourage that eagerness of the mind whereby it is carried to extend its knowledge to general theorems. And in the first inquiry, Hume allows that moralists, in their search for some common principle on which moral sentiments might depend, have sometimes carried the matter too far by their passion for some one general principle. In this case, he probably has in mind the type of objection raised by Hutcheson against the determination of some moral theorists, particularly Mandeville, to ground all moral distinctions in self-love. In the preface to an essay on the nature and conduct of the passions and affections, Hutcheson claims that the drive for simplicity commonly causes a blindness to the relevant facts. Some strange love of simplicity in, that s in the structure of the human nature has engaged many writers to pass over a great many simple perceptions which we may find in ourselves. It is most likely that Hume has some such caveat in mind when in the second inquiry's appendix on self-love he remarks that the selfish hypothesis in morals arises from a determination to reduce all appearances to a single cause. The passage in question is this. All attempts of this kind have hitherto proved fruitless and seem to have proceeded entirely from that love of simplicity which has been the source of much false reasoning and philosophy. To restrict the scope of this remark to the limited context suggested rather than allowing it to imply a wider methodological commitment um, in contrast to the case of Berkeley, is necessary if Hume is not to be caught in self-contradiction. For, only a few pages later in the same appendix, Hume says that, if we consider rightly of the matter, we would prefer his view to this selfish hypothesis, because it has really more simplicity in it, and is more conformable to the analogy of nature. So, despite the above remark, Hume does not back away from the search for parsimonious explanation. He does adhere to Newton's chief rule of philosophizing, even though, following, the, following Hutchison, he sometimes cautions against pressing it too hard. <laughs>